Welcome to the Greener Way podcast, a show about people, planet, and purpose, and how investors and corporate leaders push forward in a complex world. On this episode of The Greener Way, brought to you by Igneo Infrastructure Partners, part of First Centier Investors, we're talking poles, wires, and utilities, the infrastructure sector. Infrastructure is one of those asset classes that is heavily exposed to the risks of climate change, but which is also key to decarbonizing our global economy. Joining us to talk about what that means for an investment strategy is Niall Mills, the managing partner and head of global infrastructure investments at Igneo. Niall, can you please introduce yourself and talk a little bit about your role at Igneo Infrastructure Partners? Uh, sure. My name is Niall Mills. Um, I've been with Igneo for um, over 16 years now, um, along with um, a few of my colleagues that pretty much kicked off the strategy we've got today back in 07, 08. Um, before that, I spent 20 years in industry uh, working as an engineer and a project manager. So I'm a qualified civil engineer, uh, which is a passion I've never lost. <laughs> um, uh, but for the last uh, 16 years, we've been working on developing and building an infrastructure business that is focused on core, core plus infrastructure, which really means in, in normal language, the things we use every single day, can't do without mm-hmm. um, essential services, serving big parts of the population. Um, and as you mentioned in the intro, uh, very much part of the decarbonization journey um, and uh, the long-term focus of uh, having a, an economy that has uh, much less CO2, much more sustainable energy, um, and of course, it's sustainable employment practices. And you'll see in some of our uh, Hopefully some of the questions, uh, you'll see that we're really focused on people within those businesses too. Fantastic. I love a, we love a little bit of foreshadowing right at the top of the conversation, Niall. What drives your passion for Igneo? You mentioned before that you're a civil engineer by training. And you still have a passion for that. Um, what does that actually mean if you're, when you say you're passionate about civil engineering? Well, I, th- I think, I mean, I'm passionate about infrastructure. Engineering mm. is something I've probably had since a very early age. Mm. Um, I remember very clearly getting my first um, cassette recorder as a young kid, that's, that's a very aging statement, isn't it? Um, and the first, we the love first it. thing I did, first thing I did was take it apart <laughs> and it never really worked again after that, but never mind. At least I knew how it worked. What was um, it? Was there, think, did you have a, a gear that didn't fit in at the end or too many gears no, out of place? <laughs> no, 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 not at all. Actually, there was, there was a little rubber band, which is how the, um, the cassette was turned and oh, I decided right. I'd make it more efficient. So I put a little bit of oil on the rubber band and after that, of course, it slipped on the wheel. Oh, well. So there you go. So I even understood my own mistake. Well, there you go. Uh, so, um, but no, I, I think in infrastructure in a, in, a, in a wider sense, you know, I think we all love, uh, we all love to understand the way things work um, and operate. Um, and it's, it, it's very, very easy um, as a consumer to flick a light switch, uh, to turn on a tap, um, to get in your car and you know, maybe plug in your hybrid car these days. And assume it's all easy behind that. But actually, these are really, really complicated businesses, often with thousands of employees, uh, tens of thousands, if not millions of uh, customers. And they're driven by technology. They're driven by um, 24-7 maintenance. Mm. Um, they're run by very talented people with you know, many, many years of experience. And it's just a real privilege to work in that environment, to have so much diversity and to work alongside some amazing people, both within Igneo and within the portfolio companies that we invest in. Fantastic. Uh, we love a bit of, we love about talking about the people in the businesses. It's a bit like Richard, the old Richard Scary story books. I'll date myself as well and say I really enjoyed those when I was a kid. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'd <those> too. <laughs> okay, turning to sort of getting a little bit deeper into what this means. Um, Look, COP28 closed with an agreement that signaled the beginning of the end for the fossil fuel era. It feels a little bit weird to cast our minds all the way back to November. Um, feels like just yesterday, but also a couple of months ago. With that in mind, Igneo invests in highly intensive industries and really large physical assets as part of the strategy. How is the business looking to meet the fact that we're at the beginning of the end of the fossil fuel era and more broadly cut emissions across portfolio companies? Look, I suppose the first thing I'll say is it didn't take COP28 for us to um, decide to adopt that strategy. We've been doing it for much, much longer than that. You know, we're not driven by politics. We're driven about driving value and sustainability for the long term. Mm. And uh, so this is something we've embraced for many, many years. We do invest in uh, energy intensive businesses with large installed capital bases. Um, and as a result, you know, they, they do need a constant supply of energy, in many cases, a lot of energy. Mm. Um, but, you know, transition is a journey. Um, that's you know, stating the obvious, but it, it isn't something you can achieve in a very short space of time. But it's something that's built into all of our business plans mm. when we acquire something. 
I mean, look, we've got some really good examples of very easy carbon neutral businesses. We've got three large wind portfolios globally, uh, one in Australia called Atmos, one in um, North America called Terragen, and one in Europe called um, Finerge. Mm -hmm. And they are all large, you know, multi-gigawatt generation platforms. So, you know, we've, we've been part of this journey for quite some time. Uh, and those assets feature very strongly in our portfolio. Um, but similarly, in many of our other businesses, we've been, you know, adopting energy efficiency programs for many years. We're, we're buying energy from renewable sources mm -hmm. um, because that's not available. It wasn't available 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. um, and, and of course, where we do have embedded, I suppose, carbon-based energy, uh, we have one business in Germany that ha has a, ha a coal-fired power station. And as part of our acquisition case for that business um, six years ago, um, we bought that with an intention to close that power station five years earlier than the business had planned. Mm. So right up front, we're putting capital to work to say, yep, you know, we appreciate the management team will be closing down this power station, but we'd like to do that five years earlier. And that actually was part of our winning strategy. Mm. You know, we went to the management team, we went to the local uh, mayor of the local cities and explained to them we wanted to accelerate the decarbonisation of this business and it was part of our plan. Mm. And that meant that we very much got them on side before um, final prices were negotiated. Similarly, there was another business we, we've actually just divested in France, district heating business, a uh, tremendous business. And it again had some, uh, some coal generation on one of its sites and we decommissioned that almost straight away and replaced that with heat sourced pumps instead, heat, sour heat sourced energy instead. Um, it is what we do. Um, mm -hmm. I'm not going to pretend for a minute that it's easy in every case because, um, you know, renewable energy isn't 100% of supply at the moment. And it's quite a way from that. Um, you know, we need, we need material improvements in storage to enable renewable power to be stored when it's generated from wind or solar because that doesn't happen 24-7. Mm -hmm. But that will come. That will come. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, in every part of our lives, we're seeing us all adopt much more efficient technology, whether it's, you know, home management, whether it's electric vehicles, you know, whether it's, uh, you know, using a much lower power um, uh, lighting and things like that. So, you know, we're all on the journey, but, you know, as an infrastructure investor, we're at the bigger end of that. Mm. Um, and, you know, we have a responsibility to make a big difference, which we do. I often most appreciate the conversations when uh, with, with, either companies or investors that stand at that sort of the nexus of that of, of that X, Y axis of, you know, critical and also emissions intensive, because that's where you start really getting into the real trade offs of what we're going to do to shift as a global society and a global economy. So uh, we're right in my sweet spot, Niall. Beyond carbon and emissions reductions, look, I've, I've read a couple of years of the Igneo ESG reports, uh, which are incredibly well written as a stakeholder and layperson. Um, can we talk a little bit more broadly about Igneo's approach to ESG? Because it isn't just climate, is it? Oh, gosh, no. No, absolutely not. E ESG for us, responsible investing for us, is all about ensuring that in 10, 15, 20 years' time, the businesses that we invest in are still valuable mm. and still delivering returns for the owners of those businesses, which could well be us. And for us, that is, you know, it, it's a commonly misused phrase uh, that we've always looked at uh, investing through an ESG lens, mm -hmm. and we have. Um, and lots of people have copied that from me, um, but it's true. We always have, because we know that um, one of our portfolio companies, let's say you know, one of the bigger ones might have a million customers, might have more. If we don't provide excellent customer service and really understand what our customers want, mm -hmm. you, will, you will get customer action and they'll go somewhere else. Even in a monopolistic situation, they'll cause havoc. Mm -hmm. So understanding your customers and maintaining them at the front of your mind at all times is very important. Um, you'll not be surprised that in many um, utilities and infrastructure businesses, uh, workforce renewal, as in an aging workforce, is quite common because very sadly, in most schools these days, um, STEM subjects, science, engineering, and maths are nothing like as popular mm. um, as other subjects. So it's really difficult to get uh, people to study engineering um, and sort of you know, operational subjects. And as a result, many of the businesses we invest in have, you know, aging workforces. They've got many of their skilled engineers in their 50s. And as a result, it's, it's incumbent on us to hire 16-year-olds, 18-year-olds, 21-year-olds from school and university, bring them in and train them. Now, training a young person like that could cost you, you know, could cost 50, 100, 
thousand dollars. You know, it's a lot of money. Mm. It takes time. Mm. You don't want those people to then disappear after two years and go and do something else. You want them to stay for 20 years. So that means they have to be looked after. It means they've got to know they're working in a sustainable environment. So they want to tell their friends and families that the business they're working in is buying renewable power or is generating renewable power, um, is managing its businesses really efficiently, is not polluting the environment, is providing a safe place to work. And, you know, feel some pride. And pride is a great way for people to feel a belonging to an organization. So, you know, we invest very heavily in that. Mm. We've built training centers. We've um, partnered with universities and, and local colleges and continue to do that. I touched on the safety word. You know, it's incredibly important that um, young people in business as well, all people in businesses feel safe. Mm. Um, and one of the things that we do as soon as we acquire a business is a, a classic, and forgive me for um, teaching you to suck eggs, but a classic <laughs> corporate corporate governance structure is you've got a board and then you've got subcommittees, which are typically remuneration, nominations, and audit. Mm -hmm. I mean, honestly, why is a safety committee not as important as any of those? It is, isn't it? Mm, absolutely. A safety, a safety, of course it is, right? <laughs> it's a rhetorical yeah. question. Of yeah, course sure, it is. Sure, sure. You know, but why isn't there then a safety committee at all at all businesses, I suppose, is the follow-on question. You, you heard it here first, right? There absolutely should be. Mm. There absolutely should be. And the employees need to know that, you know, executive remuneration is not a a, a more important subject than health and safety. In fact, probably health, safety, and environment mm. is the right um, is the right level of committee. And we do that in all of our businesses. And um, even the small ones, we may combine it with something else to be efficient. But we do that across the pack. We set minimum standards. Uh, we audit, we track, we report. And in some cases, we've improved the safety and performance of businesses that we've invested in by you know over 100, 150% over four or five years. And that just comes from focus, quite often minimal investment, but best practice, engagement, showing that we care, making sure that it's on the executive scorecard for performance metrics, and it makes a big difference. So that's the sustainability angle for us. That's the, our responsible investment stretches way beyond uh, low carbon, uh, it stretches way beyond just safety. It's, it's about the holistic business and making sure these are great businesses to work in, great business, businesses to be a customer of, and great businesses to help wherever their wherever their business is located along that carbon journey as well. It seems so simple when you say it, Niall, that if you focus on great customer outcomes, great worker outcomes, and great environmental performance, it would tend to lead to overperformance of an asset. But sometimes it's worth focusing on those first principles, isn't it? Of course. <laughs> yeah, of course. I mean, I, 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 an old boss of mine said to me many years ago, I said, Niall, what gets measured gets done, what gets rewarded gets done first. I had an editor who had other ways of saying that as well, but you know, we're, we're, we're across across professions. We're on the same page. <laughs> yeah. Now, through this conversation, now you've given a couple of examples of of how um, Igneo partners with management teams. You've talked about you know going mm -hmm. in and making sure that there's a, a safety committee. Um, you've talked as well about you know uh, as part of an acquisition deal, um, getting social license to operate from local from local government in terms of a shutdown yes. plan. Are there other examples um, where either you know, uh, management teams or wider communities in which your assets are located, um, how collaborating can influence either the investment process or the investment outcomes? Um, look, that, that's quite a broad question. Mm. Um, but we always try to be a good citizen in our local communities. Mm. Now, that may well be something like um, being part of, you know, community initiatives. It may be sponsoring or being part of um, reinstatement of native wildlife that's no longer there. It may simply be, um, you know, recognizing that we'd have to focus on certain parts of the community to help employment and help, um, you know, economically um, challenged areas uh, find employment for, for their young people. Mm. So we, we're, always, we're always scanning for that to try and find the right opportunity. And that's a very localized thing as well. Your, your partnership word is very important to us, though. Um, and it's something we talk about a lot. And, you know, when, when we go to a board meeting, so, so I, sh I should qualify this as well, we're a majority investor. Mm -hmm. So we, we buy controlling stakes, if not the entire enterprise. Um, so many of our assets we own 100% of. Now that gives us a huge responsibility. Uh, and I often refer to that as, as the burden of responsibility. But it also gives us a great opportunity to you know, collaborate with management teams, to build a great management team, build a great board. Because frankly, we're appointing the chairman, we're appointing the non-executives. And if necessary, we're changing the management team, chief executive, CFO, et cetera. So the, the most important thing for me in those early days uh, post-acquisition 
is building that team. And it has to be aligned. It has to be 100% aligned. Everybody in that room, you know, the IGNEO team, the executive mm-hmm. management, the non-executive directors, the chair, has to be pointing in the right direction and have a common vision and a common goal and a common passion, frankly. Um, and when you get that, you can really achieve things quickly. Um, if you've got misalignments in the boardroom, you're doomed. Mm-hmm. You, you, not, nothing's going to happen. So change, make changes, make them quickly, make them professionally, but build a really, really strong team in that room and make sure you collaborate, make sure you're learning from each other um, and things will start to happen. Interesting. Another foundational approach. We love to hear it. Um, you said before, Niall, as well, that what gets measured, get what gets measured gets managed. Excuse me. Yeah. Um, how does this work when you're setting sustainability targets with portfolio companies? Um, and I really want to dive into this um, with a little bit of nitty gritty, if we can, because I think one of the one of the things that our listeners are focusing in, focusing in on is sort of, you know, how does that process work, you know, in terms of timelines and uh, demands and mm-hmm. reporting and monitoring. So how do you handle that at Igneo? We have a very simple framework mm-hmm. that we apply to every single business we invest in. We do this globally. This, mm-hmm. is, this is consistent across every country we invest in. We've got five minimum standards um, and we adopt our five minimum standards across um, all of our portfolio companies. Some of the very big ones may well have most of those standards in place at acquisition. Mm-hmm. Um, some don't, uh, particularly if we're taking a business and uh, spinning it out of a bigger organization. Um, they probably have very few standards at that point in time. Um, but we measure those minimum standards and report on those annually. And every single business has consistent metrics and consistent targets. Now, in some cases, for example, setting a net zero plan may take two or three years to deliver because there's a lot of work to be done. There's no, no point in saying we're going to be net zero by 2040. Okay? Mm-hmm. That's completely meaningless mm-hmm. unless there's a plan behind that that can be delivered. I would love to be on the seniors golf tour. Okay, I think that's probably the best job in the world. It's never going to happen. I could say to you, I'm going to be on the seniors golf tour this time next year. Mm-hmm. Well, unless I'm going to put in 100,000 hours of practice and get a little bit of talent as well, it's not going to happen. Exactly the same for our net zero journey. We need to know behind it. If we're saying 2040, can we deliver it? And we spend a lot of time making sure that our plans are deliverable. Once they are, they go in as a target. We report on that annually. You'll see it, you'll see it in our annual ESG reports, so mm-hmm. we're public on this. Mm-hmm. Um, and we've been publishing that for, I think it's nine years. It, we might even be coming up to our 10th year of doing that. And that was a number of years before anybody else was doing it. I have to say the first two weren't great, but we have to learn. They're getting better every year at the moment. So that's good. Let's give ourselves some credit here now. 10 years ago was before the Paris Agreement was even struck. So, you know, there's, there's, there's a, that's been a very, it's been a very big decade in terms of our understanding. <laughs> it, was, it was definitely before the Paris Agreement. And then we also have another framework that we call Climate Action 1, 2, 3. Mm-hmm. And that is about, you know, th- these are simple frameworks, but there's a lot of technical depth behind them. And that's about making sure that we have uh, a three-stage approach to achieve net zero in all of our business climate action. Mm. So we adopt those, we report on those. Uh, we also report on rel- uh, relevant regulatory standards and uh, SFDR is a big one now, you know, that we're, we will audit those, just like I talked about uh, safety committees being as important as a remuneration committee. We will audit our ESG report to the same standard as financial accounts. Mm. So we have external auditors, you know, maybe one of the big four accounting firms auditing the data that goes into our ESG report in exactly the same way as financial statements. Mm -hmm. And we do that because um, IGNEO will never be exposed to greenwashing because that would be a fundamental breach of our responsibility to our our customers, to our investors, uh, and we would never do that. So we want to have the absolute assurance that what we do can be be backed up, can be evidenced, and uh, will stand the scrutiny of uh, an external audit. We're finding that uh, that focus on audit and assurance is becoming more and more focus um, around the world, uh, not just driven mm-hmm. by SFDR, but but other regulatory responses as well. So uh, again, interesting one to sign post on. Yeah. So look, as we're coming to the end of our time together, Niall, um, let's look at 2024 in the future. Um, look, high inflation, high interest rate environment, economic uncertainty, geopolitical uncertainty, and some would say an energy crisis. Um, how do you, how do you, integrate this macroeconomic backdrop into, you know, a, a very well-developed and well-established strategy such as what you're doing with Ignea? Well, there's a, a, there's a number of points in there. I, I think, you know, all of our investee companies, all the portfolio companies have a level of debt within them. Mm-hmm. So both equity and debt, not, they're not overgeared. They're, 
in some, you know, 35, 45 kind of percent gear. So nothing like the lofty, you know, 80, 90 percent numbers you might have heard about 10 years ago. We've always, we've always been very modest. But all of that financing has been refinanced in the last two or three years and locked in mm-hmm. um, across the portfolio to give stable um, cost of debt for the next decade or so. So, you know, we're not, we're nothing like exposed to, you know, the high cost of debt and high inflation numbers that, that you might expect. I think in general, inflation is probably positive for us, just, uh, you know, we've got a number of um, portfolio companies that revenues are inflation linked or quasi inflation linked. But of course, on the other side of that, you've got staff costs, you've got fuel costs, you've got equipment costs. But I think on balance, it's either neutral or slightly positive, which is good. Mm-hmm. And that's what the asset class is meant to do. You know, if you look at you know, the macro economy, I think inflation is generally coming down uh, or getting more under control. Um, certainly for, for domestic families, mortgage rates are coming down a little bit. Um, debt is a little bit more manageable and not as frightening as it was a year ago. So, you know, we're building all that in. We've always taken a really, really conservative approach to those kind of costs um, in our acquisition models. So, you know, we're not sitting here bleeding and, and terrified that um, our business plans are being, you know, blown away by those factors. They're not. We're, we're okay. And in fact, our performance has been very stable over the last uh, few years, which is great. Mm-hmm. You know, the, the, the investment class really has stood up to that test. Geopolitical, my goodness, I couldn't even begin to comment on that. Uh, it's, it's really frightening, isn't it? Uh, we're meant to be civilized beings, but we're clearly not. Mm-hmm. Um, so, uh, but that, that, you know, I think that informs us in a way that we focus on very stable economies, very stable political regimes. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it, mean, it does mean that some areas and some, some companies are just uninvestable. And I, you know, I'm often asked, does that mean you've declined some opportunities? 100% we have. Mm-hmm. We've walked away from a material number of opportunities over the last 17 years, but also in the last few years, where we just thought, no, we can't, we can't do that. Mm-hmm. You know, we, we've, you know the, the one thing that I will you know, say is we never, ever, ever, lose sight of our responsibility to our investors Mm -hmm. and that means our responsibility to their underlying members whether that's insurance company um, clients or whether that's pension uh, members pensioners um, we'd never ever lose sight of that so we will not take risks with their money Mm -hmm. Uh, and our aim is to deliver those sustainable long-term returns in a really exciting way and a really positive way but we that's our fundamental responsibility Well, I think leaving it on the note of fundamental responsibility is as good a place as any, Niall. You've been listening to our conversation with Niall Mills, brought to you by Igneo Infrastructure Partners. I'm Rachel Allen Backus. Thank you for tuning in. Thanks for listening to the Greener Way podcast. If you liked today's show, remember to rate and review us on your podcast platform and make sure you're subscribed so you don't miss an episode. Any feedback? Contact us on podcast at fssustainability.com.au. I'm Rachel Allen Backus. The Green Away podcast is a product of FS Sustainability, a show about people, the planet, and investing in our collective future. All information in this podcast is for education and entertainment purposes only. The Green Away podcast gives listeners access to information and educational content provided by discussing numerous financial sustainable options and our featured guests. It is not intended as a substitute for professional, legal, or tax advice. The hosts of The Greener Way are not financial professionals and are not aware of your personal financial circumstances. FS Sustainability operates under an Australian Financial Service License and the exemption made available under the Corporations Act 2001 in respect to any information or advice given. Before making any financial decisions, you should read the product disclosure statement and if necessary, consult a licensed financial professional. For more information, head to the disclaimer page on the FS Sustainability website, fssustainability.com.au. This podcast is not a financial promotion by First Centier Investors and has been prepared for general information purposes only. It is not intended to be investment or financial advice and does not take into account the specific investment objectives, financial situation, or needs of any particular person. References to specific securities should not be construed as a recommendation to buy or sell such securities. First Centier Investors communicates and conducts business through different legal entities in different locations. Please refer to the notes sections of the podcast platform you use for more information on First Centier Investors in your region.